So what the heck is this blue line? This blue line is the amount of bandwidth over the last seven years that we've been consuming at Amazon in our retail websites globally. And uh, let me show you another line. What's this red line? This red line is the amount of bandwidth that we're consuming with AWS. So it has now passed the amount of bandwidth that we're using in serving our retail customers, which I think is kind of a dramatic indication uh, of, uh, of, of what's going on with AWS and, and where it might be going in the future. There are a bunch of services, and I do think most of the people in this room know what they are. They're all kind of infrastructure, foundational services. I'll go through them very briefly because I think this crowd is uh, pretty knowledgeable about these things. Our storage service basically give us uh, large data objects or small data objects, and we'll store them in the cloud uh, for you. The Elastic Compute Cloud, which is a scalable, we call it elastic because it's scalable up and scalable down. Uh, you can buy compute in the cloud for 10 cents per server hour. Simple DB, you can index and query data in real time. Simple queue service allows you to do interprocess communications, even on different computers in the cloud. Flexible payment service is the first payment service designed explicitly for developers. And there's a great deal of, uh, there's a rich feature set that allows you to build billing systems or any kind of system that you want to be able to collect money from your customers or to do peer-to-peer -peer money transfers uh, if, your customer, if your application requires that. And then finally, Mechanical Turk, which allows bite-sized chunks of work to be distributed to workers globally. Mechanical Turk is artificial, artificial intelligence. You can incorporate these little uh, code snippets in your, even inside inner loops, and they go out and they get serviced by real human beings. All of these uh, web services, these infrastructural web services, are built along a certain set of very simple principles that AWS adheres to. The first is that we want them all to be really easy to use. So the whole idea behind web services is to let companies focus on the parts of their business that's really important and differentiated about their business. And we don't want the services to be hard to learn. So the APIs are designed to be simple. We've worked hard on the documentation. Low latency. Uh, just because you're doing it in the cloud, we don't want it to be slower. In fact, in many cases, depending on where your customers are, it can even be faster if Amazon's data centers have better connectivity to the internet than your servers might in your own data center. Elastic, scalable up and scalable down. Highly available, very important, and pay by the drink. These are variable cost services. There's no contractual commitment. You don't have to enter into a year-long agreement or a multi-year agreement. You don't have to talk to a salesperson. Uh, you come and use them as you see fit and stop using them as you see fit. There's no upfront charges. We are uh, going to announce a, a new number uh, that I think is you know, very significant and we're very proud of. In October of 2007, we had 10 billion objects in S3, and now we have 18 billion objects in S3. Uh, we had 240,000 registered AWS developers a year ago, and I'm announcing today that we have 370,000 as of the end of Q1. I loved this quote. Amazon on Monday announced persistent storage for its EC2 service, and what's notable is how quickly the e-tailer is running ahead of the competition. In fact, Amazon's real business down the line will be its cloud services. Amazon will be like a bookstore that sells cocaine <laughs> out the back door. Books will just be a front to sell storage and cloud computing. <laughs> So why are people excited? Why are people enthusiastic uh, about these services? And I think I, uh, I, I have a hint of what, I, th I think I know why people are excited about this. And one way to look at the future of something is to find an analog from the past. Does anybody know what this is? It might not be immediately obvious. This is an electric power generator, um, an old one. I was in Luxembourg uh, recently and I took a tour of a 300-year-old brewery. Their business, of course, is making beer, 
And about 100 years ago, they were one of the first uh, factories in Luxembourg to start using electric power to, make, to help make beer, to help in the manufacturing process. And, of course, they couldn't buy the electric power off of the electric grid because there wasn't an electric grid. So they started making their own electric power. And a lot of companies did, the, did, did that in that era. If you could make your operations more efficient or do new things with electric power, the only way to get power was to set up your own generator and become an expert in electric power generation. The important thing to notice here is that the fact that they generated their own electric power did not make their beer taste better. And what startup companies want, actually companies of all sizes, is they want to go from their idea or their vision to a successful product as quickly as possible. And the problem always is that there's a lot of undifferentiated heavy lifting that gets in the middle between your idea, vision, and that successful product. The undifferentiated heavy lifting, by the way, has to be done at world-class levels of excellence or your vision will fail, but it's totally undifferentiated and isn't actually making the beer taste better. In the case of data centers, uh, which I think are a pretty obvious analog for electric power generation of 100 years ago, um, this price of admission, the kinds of things you have to do at a world-class level are very, very hard. Uh, it's very complex to build, a set, build infrastructure, build scalable infrastructure, build sensible infrastructure. It's always changing. Operating system versions always have to be upgraded. Uh, you end up with heterogeneous environments inside your data centers, which further complicates. Uh, as you get any scale at all, you just have to start doing some forecasting for capacity planning. How many new servers am I going to need three months from now? How many new servers am I going to need six months from now? As soon as you're in that world, uh, things get very complex indeed. And of course, you don't get to go through this undifferentiated heavy lifting just once. The successful companies are the ones who iterate as quickly as possible. They deploy uh, their vision in, in the form of a product, and then they have to change it, iterate. And it, through each one of those iterations, there often are infrastructural pieces that have to be upgraded or changed or scaled. And this can really slow down the pace of invention and innovation. I'm give you a few examples of companies that are using these services today. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, they're basically driving this innovation loop, uh, this success loop, faster because of these services. The New York Times took their uh, entire archive of articles, going back to 1851, was four terabytes of data. They had it in a, a, a format uh, that wasn't, it wasn't a format that they could uh, easily use. They wanted to convert all four terabytes into PDFs as a first step. And uh, it's a, quite a computationally intensive process with that much data, 11 million different articles. And uh, it wouldn't have made any sense at all for the New York Times to set up a fleet of servers to do this task because it's a one-time task. Once the task is over, they would want to uh, undeploy that fleet of servers. Very easy thing to do with the Elastic Compute Cloud. <clears throat> um, once they had converted all 11 million articles to PDFs, then they made them accessible through this archive website uh, using Amazon S3. So all the articles are stored in S3, and S3 serves these articles. Uh, you do a search. There's an interesting search you guys can try on the New York Times archive website. Search for computer, and uh, you'll find this. Um, this is a May 2nd, 1892 reference to a computer. And uh, as most of you in the audience probably know, in that time frame, a computer meant something quite different from what it means today. A civil service examination will be held May 18th in Washington and, if necessary, in other cities to secure eligibles for the position of computer in the National <laughs> Almanac, Almanac Office where two vacancies exist, one at $1,000 and the other at $1,400. The examination will include the subject of algebra, geometry, trigonometry, and astronomy. SanDisk is using S3 in a very innovative uh, application here where they have the SanDisk Cruiser. Uh, it's a USB drive that also, anything you put on the USB drive is automatically backed up onto Amazon S3. So even if you lose your uh, USB drive, you still have the data. Uh, here's one that's happening in real time just over the last few days. 
It's a, a fantastic example of Amazon Web Services, a company called Animoto. And uh, uh, this, what, basically what Animoto does is make it really easy for people to create videos with their own photos and their own music, or the, there's also royalty-free music that Animoto has on the site. And the way it works is the, they have some, uh, some secret sauce in their software that listens to the cadence of the music, and it basically kind of auto-edits the photos and aligns them with the music so that it looks good. Um, and, uh, you know, the, 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 they, sh- they cut from one photo to the next at the right point in the rhythm of the music and so on. If you ever hand-edited something, it's actually quite difficult to do. And so after it's mixed the video for you with your photos, if you don't like that particular mix, you just hit a button and it does it again. Um, and so you can kind of just, you know, iterate through a few iterations until you find a mix that you really like, and it makes this incredibly simple. Well, the system is built on top of uh, Amazon Web Services. In fact, they, they use many of our services, the simple Q service, they use S3, and they use EC2. I'm going to talk mostly about EC2. Let me show you a, uh, a graph. Um, this, is, this, this is all happening over the last three days. This is uh, Animoto's uh, EC2 instance usage. This is the number of server instances they're using. Let's see if I can get this laser pointer to work. So they're kind of going along here. This is about 50 EC2 instances down here. And uh, then they're, this, they, their, their Facebook app kind of broke through. And so this is their Facebook app taking off. This is just three days ago. This is April 16th. I'm sorry, yeah, April 16th. Um, and you can see that they went, they've gone from 50 instances of EC2 usage up to 3,500 instances of EC2 usage. Now, it would have been, it's completely impractical in your own data center over the course of three days to scale from 50 servers to 3,500 servers. Don't try this at home. <laughs> um, uh, and, and by the way, you, if the other alternative might be to you know, raise enough capital to deploy 3,500 servers. That's sort of equally insane um, because it's just way too big of a gamble. Um, you don't know whether you're going to get this app to take off in that way, and you shouldn't be deploying that kind of capital. Um, the other thing that's interesting to know here is see these big drops, well, this is the elastic part of the Elastic Compute Cloud because you can programmatically, all of this is controlled with APIs. So you write computer cr- programs to deploy and undeploy EC2 instances. Um, in the middle of the night or at weak periods of demand, they can actually give back EC2 instances to the cloud and they're not paying for them once they give them back. Um, and then we can try to resell them to somebody else who perhaps doesn't have such time sensitive demand. Uh, com- you know, graphics rendering, scientific compute ap- uh, applications, and so on. There are a bunch of applications that are more flexible, and we can use those more flexible kinds of uh, uh, applications uh, to smooth out the demand curves and make better utilization of the underlying physical hardware. So that's one of the kind of system-wide structural advantages of this kind of pooled computing. But you really see, you know, from a startup company's point of view, this is a very dramatic three-day period. By the way, it's still growing. I think uh, today uh, they're peaking at 5,000 instances. So uh, pretty cool uh, case study. Here's from Brad Jefferson, the founder and CEO of Animoto. He says, before AWS, we couldn't have launched Animoto in our professional video rendering platform at our current scale without massive CapEx and a lot of VC funding. The viral spike in Animoto video creations we experienced this week would have been disastrous without AWS. And you, don't, you do face this issue uh, whenever you have a startup company. You want to be prepared for lightning to strike, but you don't want, because if you're not, that's really, that's, that generates a big regret. Um, if lightning strikes <laughs> and you weren't ready for it, um, that's kind of hard to live with. At the same time, you don't want to prepare your physical infrastructure uh, to kind of hubris levels either uh, in the case that lightning doesn't strike. So this this kind of helps with that uh, tough situation. I'm going to take questions, and just before I do, 
I, uh, I just want to remind you, you know, we make electricity so that you don't have to. Uh, and uh, the electricity, if you generate it on your own, it doesn't make the beer taste any better. Uh, so thank you very much. And I hope, this is, uh, hope a lot of you out there that these, uh, kind, this way of thinking about things uh, will be instructive to your uh, startup efforts. It's very exciting. You know, in fact, when we see something like Animoto, um, it's very inspiring for us because it is a big part of why we built these services to make just this sort of thing possible. Um, and now, if there, yeah, I see there are a few questions. I'm happy to take them. Thank you. Let's start over here. And How did the idea of um, uh, the web services come about? And, and for those of you who couldn't hear the first part of the question, um, Amazon used to be in the business of selling books. How did the idea of Amazon web services come about? Um, well, uh, about four years ago, we started working on this. We, we launched our first web service about two years ago, uh, but we worked on it for two years before launching it. And so we really started this business about four years ago. And at that time... Uh, we were having enough uh, issues internally at Amazon. I think I should back up a little to reduce the feedback loop is that <laughs> uh, between the speakers and me. But we, we, we had enough internal users of infrastructure that we found we really wanted an abstraction layer between our network engineering and you know, uh, deployment, all of those kinds of very important pieces of infrastructure and data center management, and our applications programmers. And um, things were getting complicated enough at our scale that we realized we were going to have to build, we basically, the, the, we started out building these services or designing these services for ourselves so that we could use them internally. And the more we thought about it and the more we liked these, this, the idea of these services and of this abstraction layer that we could abstract away the physical hardware, um, we realized if this would be helpful to a web scale application like Amazon.com, because that's all Amazon is. It, is you know, it itself is a big web scale application. If it would be helpful to us, it would probably be helpful to others. And with a little extra work, we could externalize these services and turn them into hopefully a profit center and meaningful business for Amazon. And so that's what we did. Um, we did not expect this level of traction this early. Uh, we're delighted by it, and, uh, and, you know, and we're, we're uh, determined to continue to uh, earn trust with our developer customer set. Because it becomes a third customer set for us. We have consumers, which is our, you know, our biggest customer set and the one we're most well known for, over the last seven years, we've developed another thriving customer set, which are sellers, who third-party sellers who sell on our Amazon sites. And now this is a new customer set for us, developers, and we're super excited about it. Great. Thank you. I wanted to say it's a really elegant solution, but there's some concerns. I deal with a lot of developers. What were the changes in architecture that the outage after, um, what was it, um, what's it, um, uh, what, what's the holiday? It was a Friday after that. What did that make you change in the way you did things, and what were the causes of that problem? And also, what are the concerns, and how do you address issues where some developers feel like in the apps they develop, if they structure it for your network, it kind of limits the way they want to grow if they want to go to other topologies after you? How do you Have you seen a big issue with that with other customers as they grow on your platform? I'm and, not sure I understood the second question. Let all right, so like, the, say if I'm built on AWS for part of my server architecture, there are guys like these guys who couldn't have done it any other way, but say they have explosive growth and then they want to build their own platform, all like yours. Are there issues with them coming off of that and being able to build their own platform as they grow beyond what you may offer them in speed of response? Because that think, was, yeah. yeah I, I think the answer to the second question is there are, there's very low friction for people who want to switch off of our platform. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have, um, we don't ask for co long-term contracts. You don't have to talk to a salesperson. Mm -hmm. you, since you're paying, since a variable cost basis, you know, you're mm -hmm. paying by the drink, if we ever stop earning your business, you can leave mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we just stop charging you. Um, so there are, uh, and most of these APIs are also pretty simple and mm -hmm. structured in such a way that there's not, you know, a lot of switching cost on the API side. You know, mm -hmm. if you look at something like S3, 
the APIs that you need to you know, store and retrieve data are a very simple set of APIs that you could map onto an alternative service. Mm -hmm. So our view on this is that um, this is going to be a business with you know, multiple winners. I don't think it's a winner-take-all business. Um, for us, we're really focused on making these services as low latency, as high availability, as simple to use as possible, and as low cost as possible. And that's actually one of the places where I think our corporate heritage as a retailer, which is you know, a low margin business where you have to be extremely efficient in order to make money, um, and we do make money. We, 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 we do a good job in that retail business, but it, ha it is earned through, even though it's very low margins, it's earned through a lot of very careful uh, uh, kind of frugality and mm -hmm. focus on defect reduction. Cool. So that is, I think it's pretty easy for people to move around, mm -hmm. um, and that's why I predict that there will be multiple winners. And I think if we, uh, hopefully we can be the leader mm -hmm. of, those, of that multitude of winners. And, and for us to be the leader, given our position today, that should be possible for us. Mm -hmm. And it, it'll only be that we didn't execute well. If we're not the leader, you know, five or ten years from now, because we didn't execute well. Uh, so we're going to work very hard on that. No, I was just asking, though, the, thing, the first one was, what do you see, what were the changes in your, in your structure? What you the main things? change that we made, and mm -hmm. I think people have liked it, um, is we have tried to improve the communication that we do mm -hmm. when we have either an outage or a uh, brownout. Mm -hmm. So there are, uh, and, you know, the, the we, first goal, first point is, but we will never be satisfied until there are no outages. We want 100% availability, um, and we're going to work on that. We're going to work on it year after year after year. But what we have heard loud and clear from customers is that when there is an outage, we want really you know, detailed, fine-grained communication about what's going on. Um, and we just launched a dashboard that will make that a lot easier for people. We're trying to communicate more frequently uh, when we have any kind of situation like that. Cool, thanks. Uh, did you want to go? Are there just two sets of mics, or should we just alternate then? Okay. Great. Um, last week I was talking to a customer of mine in Canada, and their customers are hospitals. And when I was explaining to them about uh, Amazon Web Services they, uh, as something they should offer to hospitals, they said they couldn't do so because of the USA Patriot Act. And so they one, I know that the abstraction is very powerful, but do you see yourself de-abstracting across legal jurisdictions? Well, this is actually one of their whole bunch of regulatory issues around where data can reside. Yes. Uh, it's certainly true. I mean, I, I, yeah, I don't even, the, your particular question about the Patriot Act is probably way above my pay grade. It was above but my the, grade. But the, you know, I, I'm not going to be able to answer that one. But, but, the, um, but there are all kinds of, you know, the European Union has customer data rules, um, uh, any kind of, uh, Medical data often you know, can't cross national borders. Uh, and so th one of the things that we're doing with availability zones, there are really two reasons that we launched availability zones with EC2. One is so that you can have, you can, if you want a fault-tolerant application, fault-tolerant against things like fires and floods, you can deploy servers and be guaranteed that they're in different physical locations. But they're all in the USA though, right? Today, okay. they are, but that's not the plan. Okay. And then what will happen over time is that availability zones will also be in different jurisdictions so that you can choose the jurisdiction that you want for your data. Thank you. Hi. I have a friend who, um, they have a consultancy, and they run all of their Rails apps um, through AWS, and he tells me that uh, apparently spammers have ruined all of the IP addresses. Uh, and so they can't actually send emails successfully using AWS. Can you comment on what you're doing to fix that and what, what steps you're taking to, to keep the well from poisoning? I can't. It's, a, it's an interesting question, and I, and I don't know the answer. And, you know, I can go back and look at it. I don't know if anybody, anybody know the answer. Do you know the answer?
point is that the outside world would see the Elastic IP address as the same IP address, so it wouldn't, be, wouldn't appear to be hopping around. Is that the? Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Go ahead over there. Yeah. Um, uh, the, uh, EC2's Elastic capability is fantastic if you need it. Um, but for people whose hosting needs are more steady and stable, and particularly if those needs involve something equivalent to your large or extra large instances, um, then right now EC2 pricing is not really competitive with traditional data center hosting. Um, I was wondering if A, you agree with that observation, and B, if so, uh, do you have any plans to go after that market? Well, I think, I mean, actually, I think it depends it, probably on your application, your data set. I mean, we, we have gotten tons of feedback on the services. Um, one of the most, but I would say most of the feedback we've gotten on pricing has been, this is really inexpensive. Thank you. Um, and so I do agree that there are some, uh, there might be some use cases where traditional hosting is very cost competitive. I, you know, I, I, I can't guarantee you that that's not the case. Um, but uh, in, what I, what I, I guess the only way I can really answer your question is to say that directionally, our goal, and this has been true for, it's kind of a cultural trait at Amazon, our focus is going to be to be the low-cost provider of these kinds of high-quality services. So as we are able to get smarter, as we're able to uh, you know, uh, figure out how to do things more efficiently, we are going to be returning those cost efficiencies to customers in the form of lower prices on things like EC2. Um, there are other things that, you know, that it may be that we need some instance sizes, is, instance sizes, is, sizes that are smaller uh, than what we have today. Uh, uh, so the smallest instance we have today is 10 cents per compute hour. Um, and we're also looking, you know, always at, uh, you know, returning some of the cost savings we get on things like bandwidth charges, uh, disk space charges, and so on and so on. The good news is that those things do get cheaper over time, uh, and as we get more efficient and organized, we'll be able to return, I think, quite a bit of savings to customers. Okay, thank you. Yes, hi, sir. Uh, Mr. Bezos, Jeffrey. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> uh, um, first of all, I want to say I'm a big fan, and uh, I wanted to thank you um, for Gmail. And also, uh, I wanted to know what it was like to be able to launch uh, like rocket ships into space. I've always wanted to do that since I was a kid. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, that's a, well. Thank you for that question. Um, sp sp space is a passion of mine. You know, you don't choose your passions; your passions choose you. And since I was five years old, I've been uh, obsessive about space travel and you know wanting to be an astronaut and to go into space and. And uh, I have started a company called Blue Origin that is building a vertical takeoff, vertical landing rocket. It's a suborbital rocket. Um, so you'll get up into space and then come back down. Um, it's, it, the, the rocket is reusable, and it reenters and lands on its tail like a Buck Rogers rocket under rocket power. Uh, so that is, uh, and we've, we've, we've finished our first development vehicle, and we flew that. And we're working on our second development vehicle now. And there'll be at least one more development vehicle after that. Uh, and then, you know, hopefully at some point we'll enter uh, commercial operations. So it is pretty exciting. I can tell you also, um, just to kind of tie the two subjects together, Blue Origin is a, uh, a, is a consumer of uh, Amazon Web Services. <laughs> and, um, and I'm not making this up. And uh, they do... Uh, aerodynamic simulations, they, they do computational fluid dynamic calculations on the EC2 cloud. They used to have a Beowulf cluster, it was a 16 node Beowulf cluster that they would do CFD calculations on, and the uh, uh, but you know it, it's not their, it's kind of like the brewery and the electricity, you know whether they are really great at managing huge Beowulf clusters is not going to make the rocket perform any better. Um, and so, and now they're able to do these, these, these aerodynamic calculations are very, they're, they're massively computationally intensive, uh, very parallelizable calculations. And so now they can deploy, you know, very large EC2 fleets, but just for a few hours, 
do the computations that they need. And what this has done is sped up a cycle. It used to be on the Beowulf cluster, like to do one aerodynamic cycle would take, I think, like 70 some odd hours. And now they're down to where they can do one of those cycles, and I think it's less than 12 hours, which means, you know, you can, like the next day, you can see the results and tinker with the vehicle and do some more things and then, and then iterate more rapidly. So um, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Thank you. What do you think of Google App Engine? Well, I anticipated that question. And uh, it, it, we have a lot, first of all, let me say, we have a long history that, that I like of not talking about other companies. So we make exceptions to it occasionally, uh, but it's a pretty good policy in general. And, and the main reason is that what we have found in our business is that we are more innovative and do more interesting things if we stay customer-focused instead of competitor-focused. So it doesn't mean we don't pay attention to other companies and try to be inspired by them and see what they do and so on. But really, you know, if we had been a competitor-focused company instead of a customer-focused company, we wouldn't have started working on Amazon Web Services four years ago. The only way you get to start working on something for, like this four years ago is if you're really kind of paying attention to what customers might want and need. Uh, so that's a very good uh, thing. So let me talk only about AWS rather than about uh, you know, anybody else's uh, offering. AWS is a pretty unique offering at this point in time in the whole marketplace. Um, and the reason is that it's really based on very foundational, a very foundation, it's deep in the stack. Um, the kinds of uh, APIs that we're exposing are very fundamental. Things like, you know, storage. That's remembering things. <laughs> Very fundamental. Compute. Queuing. And then you can stitch those things together. In fact, several companies have written um, different kinds of application engines that run on top of EC2. So it's such a foundational layer that you can build a number of very sophisticated things on top of it. And I think that's really, you know, sort of our angle at this. Um, is to build something that has that dramatic scalability and flexibility and really give people direct control over the knobs that they need to build sophisticated applications with whatever tool set they need to be using. Um, so I guess I just leave it at that. The, the only other thing I would add is this is not going to be a winner-take-all space. I believe this is going to be um, an area where there will be Lots of winners. Uh, I think, and you know, maybe I'm very optimistic, but I think this is going to be a meaningful industry one day. I really do. I think it's going to be a significant industry. And uh, I, cause, just because I don't think it makes sense for everybody to be generating their own electric power. Um, and so, and it's very rare for significant, meaningful industries to be built by single companies. So that's why I think they're actually going to be a multitude of of companies pursuing slightly different strategies, different flavors, and I think developers are going to find many of them useful. Um, and I just hope that, you know, they continue to find Amazon Web Services useful. And I think if we continue to work hard at it and, and earn that, uh, that they will. Thank you. Hi. AWS is a shared infrastructure, and uh, especially in the case of EC2, it's a shared hosting infrastructure. And um, as you just pointed out, ultimately Amazon can't control or predict when one of their AWS customers could go viral. Um, so the concern with shared hosting is always, you know, AWS is a finite resource at the end of the day. So if two of your customers go viral or ten of your customers go viral, at some point you're going to hit the limit and, you know, new instances aren't going to be able to be launched or you're going to have capacity limitations. What can, what can you share about how, how you guys are going to manage that in the future when these events do happen? You know, I found it very interesting, the chart you showed about Animoto and the success they've, they've had going viral over the last few days. Uh, a real-world example is, for instance, last night I was unable to launch even a single small EC2 instance for, for about an, a period of an hour of time. I got insufficient capacity errors, errors back. So, so how can you address this? How can you give some assurances that people hosting in this environment, it's actually going to be there for them as they want to scale and, and these sorts of things 
for, for factors that are ultimately beyond your ability to control? Well, I think we can't control anything that's beyond our ability to control. Right. I want to get that straight right away. <laughs> how, how, how do you manage the risk? But, yeah. But, I, but um, the way to think about this is, first of all, it's better than the alternative. Because since there is a pool of servers, uh, you, you're much more, and the pool gets large, then the fact of the matter is that somebody who needs, when the pool is large, somebody who needs 3,000 servers overnight, right. that's still a relatively small part of the pool. And so, you know, the alternative would be, you know, I have 50 servers in my own data center, and I need 3,000 overnight. So at least on EC2, you have a very good chance of getting that serviced. The alternative is you have no chance of getting that serviced. So that's one answer to your question. The second thing is um, over, we, have to get, we have to be, and we're pretty good at, um, trying to maintain the right amount of excess capacity. And we get to look at much smoother uh, you know, demand increases over time because it's the average of hundreds of thousands of AWS developers. So if you're looking at any one AWS developer, yeah, trying to predict their usage is going to be impossible. It would be like an insurance company who decides to provide health insurance to one person. Right? They have no idea. Is that person going to get some dramatic illness that's going to cost them a million dollars in hospital bills? Or is that person going to be healthy for their entire life and then be killed in a car accident instantly? Right? Those are the two extremes for an insurance company. It doesn't make any sense to insure a single individual but to ensure a big pool of people makes a lot more sense. And so we have that structural advantage in terms of predicting uh, our capacity. And then the, probably the final answer I would give you to that question is, you know, the onus is on us over time to earn credibility in that regard. You know, we need to, be, uh, we need to earn that people say, you know, yeah, I, I realize Amazon can't, um, you know, it's not magic, and they can't materialize servers out of nowhere. But you know what? They do a pretty good job of maintaining enough capacity to serve me, even when I grow by two orders of magnitude overnight. So just as a quick follow-up, is there some commitment Amazon's willing to make about the level of overcapacity? Or, or you know, is, there, is there some way you can communicate some, some sorts of assurances about what are typical shared infrastructure? I don't know. Types. I mean, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question um, and maybe one we should go away and think about because there might be a subset of customers, um, you know, who'd be interested in that kind of insurance. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So my question is, how is Amazon Web, of Service, web Services or could they help large enterprise companies, I'm talking Fortune 500 companies, reduce their infrastructure costs for the deployment of software. So for example, if you've ever looked at a SAP uh, integration guide, just the table of contents is like 20 pages, and all they have to do is spend years going out getting the hardware, the storage, the redundancy. They're basically building their own electricity to do that, these companies, to integrate software. How do you see Amazon Web Services playing into that, i.e., maybe you know, SAP offers an AMI with some middleware? Yeah. And boom, not a year of deployment, but two seconds of deployment. Well, we are, we're actually, we are starting to see that right now. So okay. in fact, some of the, um, I was talking earlier about uh, computational fluid dynamic calculations of and so on. Are. There are a bunch of scientific uh, computing, well, basically proprietary people who bundle up this, you know, CAD CAM software and analytical software and who offer that, uh, and they license it. It's licensed software. It's expensive software. Yeah. Um, they are realizing that there's a real opportunity for them to bundle up an AMI with these big, you know, they all have sort of back-end calculation engines that then attach to these front-ends so that people can have their own Beowulf clusters yep. and things like that, that they can bundle up Amazon machine instances and let people have very big, uh, uh, parallelized computations on these things. And whether that would also make sense for, you know, some of these CRM companies, perhaps it would. Yep. But I think that's the kind of thing that you can see developing over time. I think it's an insightful observation. Yep. And just a quick follow-up to that is, do you think there's enough security behind Amazon? Because you often hear, you know, an open source company or that has software the company buying it wants to deploy it on their own server behind their own <coughs> firewall. 
with us, if we offered that with our software, do you think we can make a good enough guarantee value proposition to those companies to trust us to have it on Amazon Web Services? Do you think I, I over think time so. it'll be there? I, th I think so. Um, I think, you know, what, what we would expect is that people would want to understand how we're doing yep. it and, and, and be able to audit that to a certain degree. I think that the other thing is that with some application changes, which are never free, if you wanted to be especially careful, you could encrypt the data before yep. you stored it. Um, and then you know, you'd have to have a gateway, some, a trusted gateway somewhere to, yeah. do, to do that. But that's, I think, a practical solution for highly okay. sensitive. If, pe if people are really concerned, they okay. can always encrypt. Okay. Thank you. And free Thank plug, you. if anybody wants to help build that, find me. Last question, okay? Hi. Um, basically, my question's not uh, regarding AWS, but more like your other services that you recently got into, is especially the music business and the video business. And... Um, since you know a lot of people have been, a lot of us have been seeing the mobile platform you know spark in the last two years with the iPhone platform and the Android coming soon, uh, how does how do you guys see yourself uh, integrating your new services into the mobile platform, especially with the new usability is very enhanced compared to the older devices? Absolutely, and you can see that even in our usage, even people just web browsing on some of the new mobile devices like the iPhone new versions of Blackberries and so on, these more sophisticated uh, generation of devices. We're seeing a lot of retail sales coming through those devices now in a way that we hadn't seen previously, except really in Japan, where they've been a little bit ahead of the United States uh, in that regard. So um, I think you are going to see uh, more and more Amazon offerings uh, deployed in on those devices, I, you know, I'll have to just ask you to stay tuned. I can't share with you the details, but I think it makes a lot of sense uh, for those, for our digital product offerings in particular, to be deployed on a, a wide array of devices. And it also makes sense for us to facilitate mobile shopping in every way that we can. So. Thank you, and I'll just have just, to ask you. To stay tuned. I, like I have a, a question with a one-sentence answer about SDB. When do you expect to lift the 100 domain limit on SimpleDB? When do we, when do we lift the 100 domain limit on SimpleDB? We haven't announced today. We're, you know, we, we're always trying to be appropriately conservative when we come up with new products and make sure that they really, really work for existing customers. We've let a lot of developers in. We're working on a lot of new features as well as expanding that as rapidly as possible. Rest assured, we're very highly motivated to uh, you know, ungate the service as quickly as possible. But, you know, And if, and if, since he didn't really answer your question, <laughs> if, if, um, if somebody wanted, you know, to get an exception to it, could they call you with, and talk about it? So maybe that's a way to get started. Because with, with, with these services, we take availability um, and so seriously that when we launch new ones, okay. we do like to go step by step. But that's Adam Slipsky. All right. And you should contact him. I will. And I <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, you guys.